Okay, welcome to lecture 10. When I came to Cambridge and studied physics, I had the privilege of being taught by Steve Gull, and I asked him how to solve this exam question, which I suspect he was the examiner for when it was originally set. Um, we've got events with an exponential distribution. We don't know lambda. We can only see the events if they happen in a window that goes from one centimeter to 20 centimeters. We've got all the x-coordinates of these points. We want to infer lambda. I'd like to start off by asking the audience, before you heard about Bayesian inference, how would you have gone about solving this problem using classical statistics methods that you got taught during a physics course or uh, at high school or whatever, or any seat of the pants method? So would you like to tell me approaches you might have used in general or specific approaches you would use to, to solve this task? Yeah. Gradient Say it again. Gradient descent. Gradient descent in what? So you're going to maximize or minimize something. So the idea is optimize something. And what's the something that you would optimize by gradient descent? Okay. So optimize a measure of discrepancy between where the data actually arrived, which might look like that, and the probability density that you get if you pick a particular value of lambda. Okay? So that sounds a reasonable idea. You, you've got some data, you have some summary of the data, and then you adjust your model so as to get a good fit. So let's go into a bit more detail. How are we actually going to get a measure of discrepancy? What if there are three data points, for example? We've observed for an hour and we've got three points. Um, or there might be a hundred. What, what did you have in mind? And okay, so you've got a window, some width. Should we call it delta x? And do you chop up your data world into little windows of size delta x, and count how many points there are in each window? Grand. Okay, so we have windows, or I, I often call them bins. So you put data into bins. So this is an example of how we get a measure of discrepancy. First, we've got to invent a measure of discrepancy. And to do that, we're going to put the data in bins, which might look like this, where this is now the count in each bin. Or if we only got three data points, it might look like this. OK. And notice something you had to choose was this delta x. So this had to be chosen in order for this approach to work. OK, so we've got some counts. Let, let's call them f1, f2, f3 are the counts in each of these now b bins that we've got. So you compare that with what the model with parameter lambda would have predicted, I'm guessing. So let, let, let me check if you agree with this. You could work out, given lambda, what the expected value of f in a particular bin would be. And that would give you an expected number here. Here, 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 like that. When you talked about a, some sort of measure of how far apart they are, was it the distance between the actual count and the expected count that you had in mind? Some sort of inner product. Okay, so we've got a choice here of one measure of goodness of fit, which I was suggesting, is we sum over all the bins the distance between fb 
and the expected value of fb given lambda. And we better sort of take an absolute value for square or something like that. So some of the squares, maybe, is a measure of how close they are all to each other. So that was the sort of thing I was guessing. But we've had another idea. How about a dot product? Goodness of fit 2 is a measure of how similar these two vectors are to each other. So we take the inner product of FB with FB. All right. Uh, let's just have a quick think about that. If we expand the square here, we get sum of FB. Ah! We get sum of FB squared minus 2 sum of FB, FB averaged, plus sum over B average of FB squared. So if I minimize this thing with respect to lambda, and if you maximize this thing with respect to lambda, we're going to get pretty similar answers, aren't we? Because actually, this is just a constant, as long as we use the same bin sizes as each other. That's a constant, once the bins have been chosen. And this lot here, hmm, OK, it's, hmm, we're not quite sure what that'll be. But the sort of lion's share of it, it's got a factor, it's got a factor of two in front of it. <laughs> uh, it's the inner product. So these two things are actually quite similar to each other. But they're not exactly identical because of this slight difference here. OK, so we've got two measures of goodness of fit. And something you might have at the back of your mind is all these questions that we have to answer. Question one, how did you choose delta x? Okay. We, let's imagine that we've, we've solved that in a sensible way. Question two is, how do you choose between different measures of goodness of fit? And I'm not, I'm not saying either of these is a good measure. They're just the first ones we thought of. Has anyone got another approach to, to this? Um, the actual method to, to optimize was gradient descent was suggested, but it's not too important how we optimize as long as we find the optimum. When we've done that optimization, it'll spit out a guess for lambda. It'll spit out the best fit value of lambda. Um, does anyone have another approach? Because there are many approaches you get taught when you're being taught ad hoc statistical methods. And I'm sure some of you thought of methods that don't look like this or this. Gaussians. Product of Gaussians, did you say? So what's the product of Gaussian's approach to answering the question, what is lambda? OK, so uh, what Gaussians do you have in mind for this, this problem? OK, the data points, they're, they're x-coordinates. OK, the x-coordinates of these guys are exponentially distributed. Maybe I need to make clear what the assumption is. So P of xn given lambda and the window edges A and B is, when I say exponential, it's uh, one of these. It's this thing, e to the minus x on lambda if x is um, between A and B and it's 0 otherwise. <laughs> Sorry, I've got them in the wrong order. All right. Where z is the normalizing constant. z is integral from a to b, e to the minus x on lambda. So the actual probability density of each x, if we knew lambda, is an exponential. There are possibly some Gaussians running around in this. For example, if I define a bin, and if we measure the count of how many points arrived in that bin, it may be true that the probability distribution of that count, which is actually a distribution over integers, it may be reasonably well approximated as a Gaussian. So that, that's a possible direction you could go in that, do, that definitely does involve Gaussians. But does anyone else have a, a completely different approach to this problem? What, you know, did anyone study physics? OK. No one else? Yeah, OK. We've got another physicist over there. Isn't it the case that when little young physicists are taught to do stuff with their data, they're told, 
get the data, rearrange the equation that predicts the data given the parameters in such a way that you get a straight line graph, then fit a straight line. Isn't that one of the sort of rules of how to do statistical inference? Okay, so let me run with that idea. So, this was P of xn given lambda a and b. Um, it's e to the minus x on lambda divided by z, where z depends on lambda a and b. And if we get a load of points x, uh, how can we turn this lot into some sort of straight line? Well, let's first multiply by a little window, as we had before. So we'll have a bin size, p of xn, given lambda a and b, times delta x. That's now the probability that the next point will fall in this particular bin located at x. Okay, let's get rid of the n on this. Let's think of this as a function of x. This is the probability that the next point will fall in a bin of size x plus or minus, a bin of width delta x located at x, approximately, all right? So if I multiply that by the total number of data points we got, which is n, that's the expected number in a bin, and that is equal to n on z e to the minus x on lambda. And we want some way of turning this expected number, which we'll relate to the actual measured number, into some sort of straight line. Well, where's the thing that we're measuring? Here's x, so that's a variable that changes as we move the bin around, and there's a divided by lambda, and it's got an exponential, and that's horrible, but we're physicists, we know how to get rid of exponentials, we take the log, and so we can have the log of the expected count in a bin at x with width delta x. The log of the expected count is log of n on z, which is some sort of constant, um, minus x on lambda. Ooh, that's now a straight line with an intercept of something or other and a slope of minus one on lambda. All right, so if you've been subjected to the physics training that says, and it's a sort of high school thing to do, isn't it? You take the data, munge it around, get a straight line, because then everyone knows how to fit straight lines, don't they? So idea number one was let's put the data into bins and get a histogram. That doesn't solve the problem. We now need to do something with a histogram. Things we could do with a histogram, notice I've done it twice here. I did it with fat bins once, I did it with thin bins the second time, to just to emphasize the answer we end up with may depend on the size of the bins. So, here's the physics education idea. Take the log of your histogram, then fit a straight line. Okay, so the suggestion is take the actual data. The thing that is true is that the log of the expected number is some constant minus x on lambda. What we're now going to do is take the actual data, fb, and we're going to take the log of that and plot that against x. Plop, 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 plop. But, and we're then we're going to fit a straight line. And we're, there's a lot of extra questions getting raised by this approach when we say fit a straight line. How do we fit a straight line? Do we just use the straight line fitting thing that comes on your computer, that's probably what most people would leap to do. But something that could very easily be the case is when you define your bins, if you define them before you actually get the data, which is the sort of correct way to do classical statistics, you shouldn't sort of change your estimator after looking at the data, it could well be the case that one bin might have zero counts in it. Now when you take the log of zero, you're gonna have in that bin log of zero, you'll have an infinitely negative value to put into your straight line fitting method. So 
it all sounds pretty good and it looks fairly good if you get lucky. So up on the screen here, with nice fat bins and lots of data, you can see a straight line. It's definitely going to, yeah, it's going to give you the right sort of answer. But I'd like to have a universal method for answering problems. So, so just use two bins. Okay. So here's another suggestion. Take the data, put it in only two bins, and are we going to fix the bins beforehand, or will we sort of adaptively move the boundary between the bins? What you, you're wanting to do is make sure we get some points in each bin, yeah? And then do something. Okay, that's a nice idea. So idea, this was, this was idea number three. You fit a straight line. Idea number four is just use two bins, but be smart about where you put the bin boundary. Okay, so if we've got three points, what are the two bins going to be? We could put here, or here, or here, or here, or here, or here. There's actually quite a lot of latitude of where you put the bin boundary, and you'll either have two in one bin and one in the other, or one in one and two in the other. So it's a nice idea. It's probably, you know, there's probably something in it, but it's still got pitfalls, namely if you actually end up with only three data points, you kind of struggle because there's a lot of arbitrariness now about where you put your bin boundaries. Okay. Are there any other suggestions? We've sort of perhaps exhausted a whole bunch of different ways of making bins, putting the data into bins, and then doing something with those histograms. Are there other ideas? Okay, so another suggestion, suggestion number five, is could we look at the cumulative distribution? So here's idea number five. If I give you some data like that, you can deduce from it the cumulative distribution, which is nothing, one-third, two-thirds, three-thirds. So that's the cumulative distribution function from the data. And for any particular hypothesis that says what lambda is, which defines the probability density, there's also a CDF, a CDF for that value of lambda, which will be something like that. OK? And now we've got a thing that has little steps in it wherever the data points happen to come. And we've got a nice smooth thing. And we could repeat now the conversation we had a moment ago where we say, oh, let's have a measure of how close this is to this. And now we need to decide what's our measure of closeness. And where do we measure it? So we could measure it here and 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 add up all of these distances between these two CDFs. And we need to have a way of measuring distances between the two differences of some sort. And we need to have a decision about what's the density of the points at which we measure the difference. Uh, we could say, well, I only care about the CDF in this region. And someone might say, well, why? But if we <laughs> go out to here, well, why did we go to here? Um, so there's, uh, there's an issue of how do we measure? And you could come up with a whole load of answers. I'm not saying it's, it's impossible. There are, there's, a, there's an infinite number of ways of measuring how close two CDFs are to each other. And I view that as a problem, because it now means there's an infinite number of ways of answering the question, how do we fit lambda to this data? What do we think lambda is? OK, so we could do things with CDFs. That would get rid of bin widths, but it still leaves some interesting questions left over. Yes? Uh, can you take the average? The average? Brilliant. OK, so idea number six. How do we find the mean of a Gaussian distribution? Well, we just take all the data points, x, n, and we sum them up and we divide by n. And that gives us a number. And we call that the data mean. And then we can use that to construct an estimator. And for Gaussians, mu hat equals x bar actually turned out to be a really sensible idea. So that's something we can do with no bins at all. We can take all of these data points. We can take sum of x, n over n. Because the window's got a left-hand side, remember the left-hand side of the window is at A, so you can't have any points to the left of A. Maybe it would be sensible to subtract off A. It's up to you. It's not essential. Now, that's an interesting thing. That's the mean of all the distances from the left-hand side of the window. And that clearly has 
an expected dependence on lambda. The bigger va value lambda has, the more the points all surge to the right-hand side. And eventually, they don't go to the right, they go to the middle on average of this window. If you have a really large value of lambda, then you get a uniform distribution. So this isn't precisely related to lambda, but in the case B goes, goes to infinity, if the window is infinitely wide on the right-hand side, then something you might remember about exponential distributions is the mean of this guy, P of x given lambda, is e to the minus x on lambda now, with no window, divided by z. The mean of this distribution is lambda. Okay? Expected value of x is lambda. So I think that's a really good idea to say, hmm, maybe there's something in the idea of computing the mean. Absolutely, we can. So, you're now saying, let's have a measure of discrepancy between the data mean and the predicted mean. And let's imagine doing that. It, it, it's not a very difficult calculation to do. So we'll just sketch it out. And we'll keep asking questions as well. So, the expected value of x for the real distribution is the integral from a to b, e to minus x on lambda, x divided by z. And you can solve that. And it's a function of a, b, and lambda. So this is some sort of, let's call it mu of a, b, and lambda. And if this is a and this is b, and this is lambda, what mu actually looks like is it's roughly linear down here, and then it flattens out like that. Okay, so that's what mu of a, b, and lambda actually looks like. And now the suggestion is take all the data, take your 1,000 points that you've measured to enormous precision, and throw away all of the precision of that and just add them up. Okay? And people might say, oh, why did you compute the mean? You've thrown away a lot of information there. And you might worry, hmm, yeah, have I thrown away information? But you could do it, and then you've got to do something with this curve here, yeah? So uh, you work out what the actual data mean is. So you bring along x bar. You find the actual mean. What did we call it? x bar. Which I'm now defining to be the sum of xn over n. You bring it along and you zap it through this line here, and you plop it downstairs, and you say, okay, there is an estimator for lambda. That what you had in mind? I like that idea, because that you know, that's, doesn't have any bins in it, but it did involve a very big step of saying, I'm going to compute the mean. And you could have said, I'm going to compute the variance, or I'm going to compute the fifth moment, or you could have invented a whole load of other things to measure, and then you could have plotted them um, as a function of lambda. So another thing could have been plotted as a function of lambda, and it might go zoop, and then you get your data, and you come down, and you say, oh, it could be any of those things. So th there's now an infinite family of things that you could do. I think this is a brilliant idea, and you'll see why in a moment. But there's an infinite number of things you could invent which depend on lambda, and you could pick one of those, and then measure it and use it to come back and get an estimate of lambda. Okay? So that's another thing that is done in classical statistics. And it can often be done well. And you can also get in trouble, because what if the three data points, here's A, here's B, what if they were there? That could happen, right? You get only three points, and they're all to the right of the midpoint. So now you work out the mean, and it's above the midpoint of AB. And now you don't know what to do, because your method said, come across from the data value and read down. And now you haven't got an answer anymore. OK? So there's lots of ways to solve problems the wrong way. I'm reminded of a Penn and Teller video, where Penn and Teller are sort of studying a controversial topic. And it's nuclear power. And they interview a guy who has all sorts of reasons for being anti-nuclear. And they say, we believe in balance on our show, so we give a chance to every point of view to be expressed. You've heard from the idiot, now let's hear from a guy who's right. So, 
Let's now solve this inference problem using Bayes' theorem. And there will be a unique answer. There will be one answer to the problem. And it will work in any case with any, case with any amount of data, three data points, 3,000 data points. And you don't actually need to think you get the right answer. You don't need to choose bin sizes. You don't need to invent measures of goodness of fit. You don't need to invent interesting functions like the mean of the data, which in this case is a brilliant idea. But in other problems, you might struggle to think of the brilliant idea. And with Bayes' theorem, you don't actually need to think. You need to know what you're doing. You need to get it right. But it is actually mechanical. And it does take years to get used to doing things the Bayesian way. So how does it work? All right. Oh, here's a list of other ideas that people might have came up, come up with, and I think we've gone through them. Often when I ask the question, how would you solve this problem, people say chi-squared. And that goes back to the bin story. You have the count in the bin, and then you measure the difference between the count and the expected count using a thing called chi-squared. So that's, we already had that roughly in methods one and two. Um, measures of error between the theory and the data. Look at the data mean and see how that varies with lambda. Or pick some other quantity and see how that varies with lambda and use that. Okay, so that's all the ideas that are out there. And now we'll do it using Bayes' theorem. So let's write down again what the probability of the data is for a single data point given lambda and assuming that there is one exponential. And the, this distribution is e to the minus x on lambda divided by z. And z is the integral of e to the minus x on lambda. And you can do that integral. It's not hard. It is lambda e to the minus a on lambda minus e to the minus b on lambda. I really want to emphasize how easy and straightforward and simple this is. And it's just a few lines of computer code, because all you need to now put into your computer is this statement here, which defines p of x given lambda, and it depends on z. And then you put in this one, which defines how z depends on lambda. And now you're done, because Bayes' theorem says that you can infer lambda given your data by just multiplying together all these things here. So you have a whole load of 1 on Zs, n of them, and a load of e to the minus xn's on lambda. And Z is a function of lambda, and a and b. And this here is a function of lambda, and it depends on x. So the, there's lambda dependence in here, there's lambda dependence in here. And you just multiply them together, and that there is your likelihood. So this is p of all the x's given lambda and h. And you multiply that by whatever you knew about lambda beforehand. And you normalize. And this is the uninteresting normalizing constant that you don't care about if all you want to do is compare alternative theories about lambda. So let's look at the meat of this, the data dependent bit. And this is where, it, you know, the first time you see this, it, I find it just thrilling to observe what just automatically happens. You take this function. Um, let's stick with the slides. Here's the code you need to write down. I've written it in GNU plot, which is a language that you can use to define functions and plot them. So I've defined a function p of x and l, which is this function here, x and lambda. Lambda's turned into l on the board. So the top line defines p. The second line defines z. Um, I've defined z slightly differently. I've put the 1 over l into the p there, um, but it's, it's equivalent. We define a, we define b, and then we can plot these as a function of x, which is the normal way of plotting these things. So you fix lambda, and you plot p of x given lambda as a function of x, and it looks like that. And that's all very normal. So that's what it looks like for three different values of lambda. 
And if you have a very small value of lambda, it's all concentrated on the left. If you have a big value of lambda, you get a more uniform distribution. And every one of these probability densities over x integrates to 1, and it's all very normal. So the area under this is 1, and the area under the green curve here is also 1. So that's all very standard and very simple, and they're just exponentials. And then Bayes' theorem says, OK, now you want to know lambda given x. Well, you just plot the same function, but look at it as a function of lambda. So you take these innocent exponential functions and look at them the other way around. And this is what they look like. So this is the probability of x given lambda. Uh, sorry, it's not. This is. <laughs> OK. And uh, obviously, to do this, we need to fix x to a particular value. So I'm showing you three different outcomes for three different possible x's. So x could be, for example, 3, or it could be 5, or it could be 12. And this is what p of x given lambda looks like. For 3, it's the light blue curve. For 5, it's the blue one. And for 12, it's the purple one. And the amazing thing is just one of those functions, let's take the one, if we fix x to 3 and then plot p of x given lambda as a function of lambda, I'm showing lambda on the horizontal axis here, and I put it on a log scale, it's got a peak. So a single data point is now giving you this nice peaky function and saying that just one data point that happened to arrive at x equals 3, that one data point now tells you, is, tells you some opinions you ought to have about different values of lambda. And extremely small values of lambda close to 0 are essentially ruled out by it. Values of lambda near to 2 or so are perfectly happy. They did a good job of predicting it. And then larger values are slightly ruled out, but not very much. They're just slightly penalized compared to lambda is 2 or so. So just one data point can tell you something about what lambda should be. And as you pile in more and more data points, you multiply these functions by each other. The special case of a data point that's out beyond the midpoint gives you this purple line here, which is saying, OK, we can definitely rule out tiny values of lambda. There's no way lambda could be 0.1 or 0.3 or something like that and get a point out at 12. That's crazy. So that's ruled out. But all values of lambda from 10, 20, 30, 100, they're all equally probable. Um, or rather, they predicted this data point equally well because they all predict essentially uniform distributions. So they're all equally unsurprised by seeing a value out at 12. OK, so we multiply these together. And when you multiply those functions together, here I've multiplied the functions imagining that there are just three data points at 3, 5, and 12. You multiply them together, and the likelihood function has a nice peak. And we can think a bit more about what this function actually is. How does the function depend on the data? Well, this particular function depends on the data in this way. It's got a z of lambda a and b to the n, and it's got e to the minus. Let's take this product here and suck it upstairs. e to the minus sum of xn on lambda. So it's the mean is all you need to know, in fact. So here I'm rewriting the likelihood. So the brilliant intuition that said, why don't you just compute the mean of the data, is exactly right. If all you are trying to do is infer lambda, assuming there is one exponential, then the only thing you need to know is the sum of xn, and then you can work out the likelihood function. So you don't actually need to know all the data points to 20 decimal places. You just need the sum of them because of this particular form of the probability density. If the model didn't look like this, it wouldn't have been the mean that is the thing you need to know. So uh, the, the, gen the lesson to draw from this is not, oh, so now all I need to do is compute the mean of my data and I can solve any problem. <laughs> no. What you need to do is work out the likelihood function, and the likelihood function will tell you what you ought to do with your data. And in this case, the answer is find the mean, and then plot the likelihood function. And on the screen, we have a likelihood function there. And I can 
recreate these curves we were just looking at again. So here are, I'll just repeat the sequence I did. Here are three probability densities over data space, over x, for three different values of lambda. You could imagine getting data at points such as 3 or 5 or 12. Now, the predictions of these different models with different values of lambda are simple exponentials, but something you can notice about them is there are places, for example, the left-hand blue line, where the red is above the orange is above the yellow. So the red wins, it predicted better. There are places where the yellow is above the orange is above the red, and there are places where the orange is top. So there are outcomes such that any of those three can be the winner in terms of having predicted better than the other two. And that's another way of saying when we plot the likelihood function, there may well be a peak as a function of lambda. So now we do that, we plot the likelihood function, and this is the likelihood multiplying together those three um, numbers. And I've shown in red, orange, and yellow here the three values of lambda that we were considering a moment ago. We looked at lambda as 2, 5, and 10. This is when you get data um, at, at, the three, um, at the three points um, that I mentioned before. Okay, let's do it one more time. What's going on? Mm -hmm. Okay. Try again. Okay. So just going through the, the sequence again. Here's three places you could get data. The left hand point points to the red hypothesis being the most probable. The data point at five prefers the hypothesis that lambda is something like five. And data points out at the right-hand side prefer the hypothesis that lambda might be 10 or so to the hypothesis that lambda is 2 or 5. So this is what the likelihoods look like if you get just one data point that is respectively at 3 or 5 or 12. And this is the product of those. Okay. So that's Bayes' theorem for finding a single parameter lambda. And wasn't that easy because all you had to do was write essentially uh, 1 to three lines of little GNU plot to define the function, and now we've got this bump that tells us the answer. It tells us what, how well those alternative values of lambda predicted the data that actually happened. And it works for three data points, and it'll work for 3,000 data points as well. Yeah? So you haven't actually told us how to pick the lambda. Okay, who said anything about picking lambda? Yep. The question said, what is lambda? And I think the correct way to answer that is either do you really want me to pick lambda? If so, tell me how. But if someone says, what is lambda? I think the correct way to answer that question is, well, it's roughly this or plus or minus this. So I think the way to answer a question, uh, you know, how heavy is this book? Uh, I don't want you to give, uh, give me a number. I, I want you to say, well, it, it could be uh, it, 200 grams plus or minus 100. I'm not very good at estimating weights of books. So the, the exam question said, what is lambda? It didn't say, provide a single point estimate of lambda. If you want a point estimate, guess what? I might maximize the likelihood. But I'm not addicted to maximizing the likelihood because you could get silly answers. Remember a moment ago, we were looking at the Gaussian distribution, and Mr. Gaussian, with a single data point, had infinitely big likelihood down here. This was mu, this was log sigma, and you can actually get infinite likelihood down here. So maximizing the likelihood doesn't have any fundamental status. It may well be better than a whole load of other ways of, of doing things. It's a, a, a fairly coherent principle, but it can be dangerous. So what would I say is the answer? I would return the likelihood, and if someone wants a quick summary of roughly what the likelihood looks like, I would see if I can find a peak, and I'd give some description of how broad the peak is. So I'm, a, a very common thing you can do with data like this is if you've got more than three data points, you can probably make a Gaussian fit to that blue curve on the screen. And you can say, well, the likelihood function, here's the formula for it, and here's a, a function that will compute the likelihood, and here is a Gaussian approximation to that. It's got this mean and this standard deviation. So that's the general method I'd, I'd suggest that often works well. You take your likelihood function, and you approximate the likelihood by a Gaussian, maybe. So this isn't a rule. 
but it's a, a suggestion. When you approximate it by a Gaussian, you need to describe what the you need to decide what the variable on the horizontal axis is. Here, I've chosen to have log lambda be on this axis. You could also have lambda be on the axis, and the whole graph goes <laughs> and looks much more lopsided. And a Gaussian approximation in one space may not be as good as a Gaussian in another. Okay, the question is, looking at these three likelihoods for single data points on the top of the screen, does the yellow one, which is the, probab the probability of x equals 12, as a function of lambda, does it have a peak at all as lambda goes to infinity? And the answer is no. All those values of lambda give identical predictions. So it just asymptotes to the value 1 over 19, because the window is 19 wide. And so all of those in the limit put their probability density uniformly over 19, a space 19 centimeters wide. Um, it, uh, yes, if you change the width of the window from being 19 centimeters wide um, to, to being, say, 190 centimeters wide, then it would have a peak again, just as for three and five, and any point to the left-hand side of the midpoint, you get a peak. Uh, that's the rough rule of thumb. I think I'm right in what I said, that if the point is to the right of the mid midpoint of the window, you don't get a peak, and if it's to the left, you do. Yes? Could the likelihood function have multiple peaks? Could the likelihood function have multiple peaks? Definitely, in general, it could. For this problem, it can't. It's unimodal for this problem. But in general, likelihood functions can go all over the place, and we will come up with many examples of that in future lectures. Okay, what I want to do now is I want to move on. Um, oh, you can do this for any data set. So here's another data set with just three points, and they're at 1.7, 1.5, and 2. So it's still only three data points, but now you see the likelihood is much more sharply peaked. So it depends on what the data actually turn out to be, how sharp your likelihood will be. And it's possible with three points all to the clustered to the left-hand side that you can get quite a good estimate of, of lambda just from three data points. An approach that used bins of a fixed size that was fixed before the data arrived would probably be hopeless at this sort of thing. But the likelihood function does the right thing for you. When you can get a very precise answer for lambda, even given only three data points, it gives you that. So we hate putting data into bins, and hurrah for the likelihood function, because you'll never need to use bins ever again. OK. I want to finish in the next 15 minutes with another question. The topic for today, it's lecture 10. <laughs> the topic for today is inference of parameters and models. And if I gave you some data like this, and if I didn't just say, they come from one exponential, tell me lambda, if I said, I'm not actually sure if it's from one lambda, one exponential, maybe there's a mixture of exponentials, please tell me what I should think about that. Is it credible, given this data, that it comes from two Gaussians rather than, sorry, two exponentials? rather than just one. How do we solve that problem? Well, let's write down Bayes' theorem again. So, have a chat to your neighbor about how to solve this problem while I wipe the board. OK, so what we're going to do now is we're going to introduce two hypotheses. One is hypothesis one, which we've just been working on. Hypothesis one which is named after the number of parameters it's got, the number of exponentials. So here it is. And this is how we fit h1 to the data. The fitting involves thinking what its lambda, its one parameter lambda, might be. And there we are. That's what we do. And the prior, I, was, I didn't even specify what it was. The sort of thing you might do in this, uh, if it were a real life problem, you might think a little bit about if you know anything about lambda already, you know, if it were shorter than something or other, then the universe would explode, and if it were bigger, then we'd all be dead, or something like that. So there might be a range of values that you're pretty sure lambda must be within, and if you really don't know anything about lambda apart from that, you might be tempted to have some sort of uniformish prior between those values. It actually depends what the problem is, what you should do about this thing. It is subjective, and that's the way I think it has to be. And so the sort of thing that the prior might be is some uniformish distribution over some broad range of perhaps values of log lambda. Okay, 
So I'm not saying it has to be that way. That's just the way I often work if I have real inference problems. If I've got a positive quantity lambda, a decay length, I'll tend to think of the log of that variable as a natural way to work with it and then maybe put a prior on the log of it rather than directly on lambda itself. What this implies for the prior on lambda is that it, it may be a bit of a sort of lopsided prior looking a bit like this because this prior is saying that values such as 0.1 and 1 and 10 and 100 are all just as likely as, as each other and that means we've got a, a bias if you like to small values. Uh, okay, so I haven't obsessed about this prior, but it's going to become slightly more important in a moment. We're now introducing a, a second hypothesis, and the second hypothesis says that the probability density of x, if you knew lambda 1 and lambda 2, and if you knew quantities, let's call them pi 1 and pi 2, which are the weights of the two exponentials, so these are the length scales and these are how much probability mass is in each of them. The probability of x, given those parameters and h2, is e to the minus x on lambda 1. Um, plus e to the minus x on lambda 2 on lambda 2 multiplied by weight pi 1 and pi 2, and for simplicity, um, we could pretend that the left-hand side of the window is at zero from now on, um, but maybe I didn't need to say that. Um, so that is a mixture of two exponentials, and yeah, let's retract what I just said. This is true for all x between a and b, and it's zero otherwise. Okay, so H2 has got two interesting parameters, lambda 1 and lambda 2, and it's got another couple of parameters, pi 1 and pi 2, which are probabilities that sum to 1 and they're positive. And to get on with it, I'm going to declare that they're both a half. So I'll just simplify life and say um, that half of the mass is in uh, one exponential and half is in the other. And I didn't have to do that. It'll just make it a bit easier to do what we're, we're about to do. So the model will only have two parameters rather than three. Okay, so we've got a one-parameter model and a two-parameter model, and we can do inference with both of them. So we can infer lambda 1 and lambda 2 given uh, a load of data and h. And that involves working out the probability of x given lambda 1 and lambda 2, which is the product of all of these things. I'm now suppressing the pi's because I've just arbitrarily decided that pi 1 is, is a half. And we have a prior on the two lambdas. And we have a normalizing constant, which is the probability of the data given h2. So that's how we, to put it crudely, fit model 2 to the data. Or rather, it's how we infer lambda 1 and lambda 2 given the data. And it's got a normalizing constant that we don't care about because it's just a normalizing constant if all we're doing is thinking what we believe lambda 1 and lambda 2 should be. However, if we now want to do model comparison, then what we want to do is say, how probable is h1 given the data? And how probable is H2 given the data? And the answer to this question can also be found by Bayes' theorem, by writing down the rules of probability starting from our assumptions. And that's P of data given H1 times whatever your prior belief in H1 was divided by a normalizing constant. And this one is the probability of the data given H2 multiplied by the probability of H2 divided by the same normalizing constant. And if you like, I am suppressing here some further assumptions that this all depends on, which we could call, hmm, let's call it I, for other assumptions. So those are all lurking here. A key assumption here 
is the assumption that either there's two exponentials or there's one exponential and there's the assumptions about the priors uh, on the, their parameters. So all of these things depend on those remaining assumptions. I'm not wanting to hide those at all. So the beautiful thing to notice here is if you have carefully solved problem one, which was please fit model one to the data, and if you have carefully solved model problem two, infer lambda one and lambda two, and if you have done that in a way that spat out a piece of chalk, that spat out this normalizing constant, so if you didn't just ignore it, but you computed it when you were solving this inference here, so this is parameter inference, parameter inference, if you got the normalizing constant, that is exactly what you need in order to do this Bayesian inference here. It's the data dependent term, and the other one, which we have over here, I've lost my green. So let's color this frilly red. This normalizing constant in frilly red is this one here. So we have two little tasks to do, parameter inference, and then you're done. Because if you did your parameter inference properly and you got the normalizing constant, you've already done model comparison as well. You've got the number that you need in order to do model comparison. So let me step you through this, and I'm going to do it in a slightly different way from what I wrote down here. What I just described here would work just fine. We've got a function of x, lambda 1, and lambda 2 here. Um, oh, I forgot to divide it by z, sorry, z of a, b, lambda 1, and lambda 2. So we've got a function here of x, lambda 1, lambda 2, and you can just multiply it all together and then normalize. But there's another way of thinking about what's going on here, which is if you believe that there's two exponentials and you get a load of data, you could imagine that those data came out, and some of them were colored white, and some of them were colored red. And the color could be telling you which exponential they came from. So white was lambda 1, and red was lambda 2, for example. And then someone was cruel to you, and they rubbed out all the colors and just told you the x coordinates. But you could imagine trying to infer what those missing colors were. And we could do an inference that involves naming those missing colors. So I'm going to rewrite now model 2. And I'm going to say that my world has in it a lambda 1 and a lambda 2, which we don't know. And it's got coordinates xn. And it's got colors. Kn, with n going from 1 to n. And now the way that we get all of the data, if we knew lambda 1 and lambda 2, is we first pick a color, and then we draw uh, the point from um, that. We draw the, the next point from the distribution conditioned on the color. So. We can write this as probability of the colors given lambda 1 and lambda 2. And the probability of x given the color in lambda 1 and lambda 2. And we can put a product out here. Product from 1 to n. Pick the color, and then pick x. OK. Then we can do a variety of inferences. We can still work out the probability of lambda 1 and lambda 2 if we want, but we can also work out other things. We could work out how probable is it that the correct coloring of all these points is kn from 1 to n, given the data 
and assuming that H2 is true. We can ask questions like that. And we can ask questions like this. What do we think lambda 1 and lambda 2 are, given the data, and assuming H2 is true? Which is the question we just asked a moment ago. So there's a range of, of questions we can ask. And I'm going to enumerate this entire hypothesis space of different hypotheses about lambda 1 and lambda 2 and Kn. So what I'm going to show you now is I'll ask the computer to show us how well the data are predicted as a function of lambda 1, lambda 2, and the colors So I'll plot that likelihood function. So I'm now increasing the number of parameters in my problem from 2 to 1, 2, brum, whatever n is. So if n is 8, I'm giving myself a total of 10 parameters. Um, two real numbers, and then 10, sorry, 8 categorical variables, which are each either red or white. And we can look at the likelihood function as a function of all of those. And I'm going to imagine that set of possible values of lambda 1 and lambda 2 and k, which is k1 through kn, is living in a stack of pancakes here. So every one of these pancakes has a lambda 1 axis and a lambda 2 axis, and there's discrete pancakes, and the number of pancakes is 2 to the power n. So the bottom pancake is the one that says that k1 through kn is 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. So they all come from one of the um, exponentials. And here's the top of the pancake, which is k1 through kn, is all zeros. I'm going to call them 0 and 1 because I'm working on a computer now instead of 1 and 2. And in between, we have all the other possible labelings of the points. And for every hypothesis about what the labeling is and what lambda 1 and lambda 2 is, we can then work out what the value of p of a particular data point is, given lambda and all the k's. In fact, we can work out the probability of all of them by multiplying those n quantities together. Right. So let's do that. Right, so here are some data points. I'm going to repeat this exercise for four different data sets. And what I'm going to do is show you the inference of what we think lambda 1 and lambda 2 and k are. So I'm going to show you the, the, the stack of pancakes. And I'm also going to run the inference for the simple model that says that there is only one exponential. So I'll go back to, the, to model 1, and I'll show you the inference for model 1. And here's what I'm actually going to do. I'm going to start just by doing the inferences for model 1 again, and then we'll move on to doing model 1 and model 2. So here's a super simple data set with just four points in it. That's what the likelihood function looks like as a function of lambda or as a function of log lambda. So that's what we did a moment ago. So I'm just showing you again, perhaps on a slightly different scale, the things you're familiar with. This is what you get if you take the maximum likelihood value of lambda. So you take a point estimate of lambda, and you show its density in data space alongside those four points. All right? So I'm introducing you to the sequence of things I show you. I show you the, the data. I show you a likelihood function. And then I show you the best fit distribution, the, the fit that maximizes the likelihood. And then, just for the sake of argument, I show you what might have happened if we had chosen some bins to put the points in and counted how many were in each bin. So there's two blue bins showing a little histogram, um, which may be food for thought. OK, here's more data. So uh, about 20 data points or so. And you can work out the likelihood function. And because you've got a lot of data, the lambda is quite well determined. Um, it's characteristic in this sort of problem that typically the width of the peak shrinks as the square root, shrinks as one over the square root of the, the number of data points you've got. So that's a useful rule of thumb to, to have for this sort of problem. 
and that is the best fitting mean curve. Sorry. That's the green curve that maximizes the likelihood for the model that says there is only one lambda. But if you have very careful um, eyes and a skeptical mindset, you might look at this clumping of points to the left-hand side and say, hmm, I'm not too sure about that. So you might be a skeptic about the one lambda hypothesis. That's what the data looks like if you shove it into bins um, of a particular t width that I just invented. You could say, oh, you should have used smaller bins, but then you'd have a lot of zero counts running around. And we know zero counts might cause trouble for some methods. Um, so data in bins, not that we care about bins, but just to remind you the th methods that we're not using. OK, let's move on to data set number three. I've slightly reduced the amount of data because I want two to the n to be manageable. So I've got a data set here that I've deliberately chosen to have size eight points. So two to the n is 256. There's 256 hypotheses about how these points were actually colored in red and white before the colors were erased to make them all blue. So there's some data. And now we're going to fit model one in the same way as before. And we're also going to look at model two. So here's the likelihood function for model one, showing it as a function of lambda. And here it is as a function of log lambda. And that is the best fit uh, green curve, the best single exponential that you get by maximizing the likelihood. Now, there's the histogram um, using a particular bin size, just for people who are interested in bins. Now what we're doing is we're going to rattle through the pancakes. So there's 256 of them, and I've rattled down to pancake number 7. Uh, the labeling there, K1 through Kn, is in binary. So you see 000111. It's the seventh pancake. And the likelihood function for any particular label in K is beautifully simple, because if you knew K, then you would know that the last three data points all came from lambda 2, and the first five points all came from lambda 1. And the likelihood function, probability as a function of uh, lambda 1, is just the simple function that we had before for model, for model 1. And the likelihood as a function of lambda 2 is a, the same function um, that we had again for model one, if you know which points go with which uh, cluster, with which exponential. So this is a super simple thing. It's just a product of two of the two functions that we are already familiar with, because we plotted them when we were dealing with model one. And as we rattle through the pancake, that blob, which is a simple separable function, just moves around because uh, different labelings put, put the best guess for lambda one and lambda two in different places. The final stack of the pancake, the final layer is one that says they're all from lambda 1, in fact, is the way around I've got the... So um, the all 1s hypothesis says they all belong to lambda 1, which means lambda 1 is quite well determined, and we have got a clue about lambda 2, because none of the points actually came from the second cluster. OK, so some of the pancake uh, surface plots look um, like this, and many of them look like little blobs. And they're all in different locations. So, got blob, 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 and hump. And this one up here will be a hump. Just the same hump, but rotated 90 degrees. Right, what can we do with all this information that we've accumulated? We've run through a total number of hypotheses to the tune of 256 times the number of points I looked at in each pancake. The number of points I looked at was 32 times 32, so 1,000 points in every pancake. So I've computed 256,000 numbers here, which are for every one of those sub-hypotheses, 256,000 sub-hypotheses, for every one of those, how well did, did that sub-hypothesis predict the data that actually happened? When we know that, we can then read out anything we're interested in. For example, we can read out how probable are alternative values of lambda 1 and lambda 2? You get that essentially by summing all of the pancakes on top of each other. And that's what that looks like. So two bumps. One, well, what that's saying is, yes, this data, which someone with a keen eye might have thought um, liked, um, someone with a keen eye may have thought that there's evidence for two exponentials in there. This is saying, oh, yes, you can get a much better fit to this data by giving yourself two lambdas. And what that surface plot looks like with pretty colors is shown here. And what it looks like as a contour plot as a function of 
lambda 1 and lambda 2 is shown here. So two very distinct bumps saying, yes, you can either fix lambda 1 to a small value and lambda 2 to a big value or vice versa. And those are by far more probable than other values of lambda 1 and lambda 2, for example, that they're equal to each other, which would lie along um, the diagonal here. We can also ask the question, what's the posterior distribution of the labels? What do we think all the Ks are? And there's 256 hypotheses. And this is the sum. It's essentially the sum of everything in the pancake. All right. And you sum that up. And uh, you find that the different labelings have different probabilities. And there are two labelings there that are the most probable labelings, which correspond to one possible assignment, reds and whites, and the other opposite assignment. It's got symmetry about the middle because the binary representations have the property that if you take one labeling and you reverse all the ones and zeros, you switch between integers that sum to 255. So that's why it, it looks, uh, why it has that mirror symmetry. Okay, so we can now read out, if we're interested in, in it, the maximum likelihood uh, value of, for lambda 1 and lambda 2. And that's shown here. And the purple line is showing one of the exponentials. And the gray line is showing the other exponential. And the green line is the um, sum of those, those two exponentials. And the green line sits on top of the gray line most of the way. So you, you, you can only see a little bit of the gray line. OK, so that's the maximum likelihood hypothesis using two lambdas. Then. Um, we can repeat this for another data set. And what I wanted to show you before we do that is let's answer the final question, the model comparison question. You compare the models by summing up um, and getting the normalizing constant. And the code I just ran as we went through these examples did that. And for this third data set, this is what happened. Um, the third thing, evidence one, is this quantity here, evidence for model one. There's that guy. And evidence two is this guy. So evidence one came out 5.4 times 10 to the minus 7, an extremely small number, because uh, what we're talking about is predicting a with a probability density over an eight-dimensional space where those eight data points will be. So it's not surprising to have an extremely small number for the evidence because um, we're predicting in a, a larger space um, a, a real valued, eight real valued quantities. Um, evidence number two, when you tot it up, comes to 1.4 times 10 to the minus 5. And what that means is the evidence ratio, which is what you need if you want to know the probability ratio between these two um, numbers here, evidence ratio is 26 to 1. To actually work out that evidence ratio, I did need to make an assumption about what the prior on lambda was. And I've gone and forgotten what prior on lambda I actually chose, but it was uniform over log lambda in some range, I forget from, from what to what, so four orders of magnitude or something like that. These answers do depend on that prior, but not in a super sensitive way. So obviously, it has to depend on your assumptions, but you shouldn't worry about that particular assumption being uh, a terrible um, uh, sort of game breaker. Um, if it is a game breaker, you can find out. You can explore the sensitivity of the answers to these questions to those assumptions if you're worried about whether you've thought carefully enough about your assumptions. And in this case here, this particular data set gives you an evidence ratio of 26 to 1 in favor of model 2. So if they had equal prior probabilities, you get this data and you end up saying it's 96% to 4% or so in favor of model 2. Now, the final thing to emphasize is that it didn't have to come out that way. There are many ways of fitting models. For example, if someone does a maximum likelihood fit and you say, ah, now how do I tell which model is best? Well, let's pick the model with the biggest likelihood. If you do that, you'll end up always choosing model two because trivially, model two with its extra parameters can achieve a better, a, a, a bigger likelihood. Um, but that isn't how Bayesian model comparison works. It involves doing this summation. We, we do a comparison based on the normalizing constants. So we don't look at what was your maximum likelihood. We look at what's the 
aggregate of how well you predicted the data, summing over all your possible values for your hypotheses. And it's not necessarily the case that Model 2 will always win. Indeed, there are data sets for which Model 1 wins. And that's the final thing I'll now show you. So this final data set, shown here, is a data set that really did come from a single exponential. So I drew eight points from an exponential. And off we go with the likelihood function for Model 1 on log scale, maximum likelihood fit, and some bins. And then we do Model 2, and we run through all the pancakes. And it looks just the same as before um, to a casual observer. We have these bumps wobbling around as we run through the 256 assignments. And now, when we say, what's the marginal likelihood of lambda 1 and lambda 2, you find it's actually, it looks fairly unimodal. It's not exactly unimodal. If you make a contour plot, and if you go and zoom in to the peak of this and look super, super, super carefully, you can't see it on the screen now, but you could do this, you actually find that you can get a slightly bigger likelihood by uh, having lambda 1 not quite equal to lambda 2. But they're very, very similar to each other. All right, so that's the likelihood of lambda 1 and lambda 2. And this is the posterior distribution of the labels, just as last time. Some labelings are more probable than others. And we can work out the evidence ratio. And the answer for the evidence ratio is shown here. It's 0.27 the other way. So now the, the more probable model, in this case here, is model 1, which comes out 78% to 22% if they were equally probable in the beginning. So that is how model comparison works. And what I take away from this is, given that standard ways of fitting even a model with just one parameter uh, can run up against problems, unless you use Bayes' theorem, uh, I find this quite a compelling um, argument for saying, yes, let's use Bayes' theorem for more complicated problems where we might have as many as two parameters running around. So that was an introduction to inference of parameters and model comparison. What we're going to do next time is we will move on to the topic of clustering and I'll discuss some um, quite popular algorithms for doing clustering which can be used for things like um, uh, maybe uh, character recognition and uh, speech recognition problems. Here's an example from speech. You could take a single word utterance and take its uh, spectrogram and the, all the objects on the left uh, at the top are people saying um, the word, uh, which is it? One of them's one and one of them's zero. Um, zero, zero. Um, I guess the right-hand ones are the zeros and the left-hand ones are the ones. And then you train up on all of those training examples, then someone gives you some more words and you need to recognize which they are. And you could imagine that as a, a clustering problem. Yeah, so the ones were on the left and the zeros are, are on the right. So we'll talk about clustering, and I'll describe a popular method for doing clustering. Then we'll give it a Bayesian interpretation and discuss how to make it uh, better using that Bayesian interpretation. So that's the first thing we'll do next time. Are there any questions? OK, thanks very much. Yeah. OK, the question is, have Bayesian methods not been used frequently because they're computer intensive? I think that's not really the answer. It certainly makes it easier to use Bayesian methods if you've got a computer. Uh, but I think it's a sort of strange accident of history, really, because it's perfectly possible. You know, take a problem like this one we did here uh, with a single e exponential. It's perfectly straightforward to work out the likelihood function and sketch it by a variety of, of, of methods. So we didn't need a computer to do it. Um, and so I think it's, it's more a, an accident of sort of personalities and, and political fights between academics that these other schools doing things other ways uh, grew up. And th there's this urge to have a, a so-called objective method. And Bayesian methods got labeled subjective. And people deluded themselves into thinking that these other methods weren't actually uh, subjective as well. So. 
yeah, having computers definitely makes it straightforward to use a lot of Bayesian methods. And we're, we're going to discuss a whole bunch of ways of uh, doing practical Bayesian methods on computers. But way back before computers were even thought of, the earliest work on inference um, was perhaps being done by Laplace. And Laplace, uh, the correct name for Bayes' theorem, incidentally, is Laplace's theorem, because Laplace used it in anger on real data. He got data on the orbit of Saturn, and there were things to be inferred, and he used Bayes' theorem, Laplace's theorem, to, to do those inferences. Uh, so it, he knew um, that it was the right way to do things, and that was the, the birth of, of Bayesian inference. So it's not for lack of computers. Uh, there are other explanation, explanations, perhaps partly social explanations. Okay, thanks. See you next week.